transformation this morning. And so we're asking that as a gift of your spirit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I, I, I wonder, you know, when it, when it comes to risk in life, what do you think faith looks like? You know, uh, does faith take financial risks believing that God's going to cause everything to work out in the end? Or does faith avoid taking financial risks because we ought to be content with whatever we have and to, to take on a risk in order to gain more shows a lack of contentment? Uh, you know, uh, when it comes to your job, should you, should you risk leaving a stable job to move to a, a new job that might promise to provide better for you and your family and enable you to be more generous with others? Uh, when it comes to purchasing a car, should you purchase the cheap one that, you know, might give you some trouble, but you pray the Lord will just make it run as long as you need it to? Or do you spend more for the car that is more likely to be dependable? When it comes to your health insurance plan, you know, do you, do you take the risk of high deductible and low monthly premiums or or do you pay more each month in premiums so that you avoid the risk of that high deductible? There are so many places in life, aren't there, where, where we have to make decisions accounting for risk. How do we do that as followers of Jesus? That's the question I want us to try to get some help with this morning as we look at God's word in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And so if you brought your Bible, and I hope you did, I want to invite you to turn there with me. Ecclesiastes 11. If you've got a digital device you can use to pull up the Bible, uh, I'd encourage you to search for the ESV, the English Standard Version. That's the translation of the Bible I'll be reading from this morning. And so if you search Ecclesiastes 11 ESV, you'll be able to follow right along with me. And I'm going to begin reading there in verse 1. We read, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. And the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever, and this is God's word to us today. And in verse 1, we're told to cast our bread upon the waters, for we'll find it again after many days. And I'll tell you, as a kid, I threw enough bread in the duck pond to know once I've cast my bread on the water, I don't want it back. Like, who wants soggy bread? Especially soggy bread that's been in there in that water with the ducks is filled with animal feces. I will pass on that. No thanks. And so you got to wonder, you know, like, what, what exactly is God trying to tell us here in verse 1? And some people, they, they say, you know, uh, we think what is being said here is that this is all about charity. That what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to take what you have, your, your bread or your possessions, and you're supposed to be charitable. You're to be generous with that and, and share it with others. And if you're generous, if you're charitable, in due time, you'll receive a reward. You'll, you'll either find help when when you need help in the future, someone will come to your aid, or on the last day, you'll receive a reward from God himself. And so they would say, look, uh, verse one is saying, look, be charitable. You ought to be charitable and generous. You ought to be completely generous and then some, because verse two says, give a portion to seven. And in the Bible, uh, seven is the number of completion or perfection. So be, be completely generous, but then you're told, even give a portion to eight. Don't just be completely generous, be completely generous and then some. And here's the reason why, because you don't know what disaster may happen on earth. You don't know what may happen to you in the future and you might need the help from others. So you ought to help them now. And that could be what these verses are about. But others would say, no, um, what these verses are about, they're about farming. 
Uh, you see, you got to remember that this land in the ancient Near East, it was land irrigated by the Nile. And so the best way to farm was to wait for the flood. And when the, the Nile River spilled over its banks, you'd let those floodwaters start to reside, uh, recede. And once, once they were about down into the ground, you would cast your, your seed into that water, into the loamy soil, and then you would get the best harvest. And so what verse one is saying is that you ought to, you ought to plant your seed when you can't see the ground completely because there's still some water there. And that, that could be what these verses are about. But I think the best way to understand these verses, at least the way that makes the most sense to me, is to say that these verses aren't about charity and, and they aren't about farming. They're more about international trade. Uh, you see, when, when you harvest your barley, you got a choice to make. You can, you can sell your harvest there locally for a profit or you could take a risk and you could put some of your harvest on a, on a ship that's gonna sail across the sea to a different location where you could sell it for a higher price, receive a, a greater return. That's a risky proposition because once your harvest leaves your hands, you know, that ship could sink. Uh, pirates could steal your goods. Maybe, maybe the ship captain himself would just run off and never return. He'd take your crops and your cash. And so there's risk involved, but, but it could yield a better return. And I, and I think what verse 1 is saying is, it's saying, look, you, you ought to be willing to embrace risk you, you, ought to, you ought to be willing to take risks in order to receive a greater return. And then what verse two is saying is as often as you're able, you ought to try to mitigate your risk by diversifying your investments. Notice it says, give a portion to seven or even to eight. Now you've heard the saying, don't put all your, your eggs in one basket. This is saying, don't put all your bread on one boat. You know, if you if you... You put a little bit of your harvest on this ship and a little bit on that one. If you, if you don't put it all on the same ship because you don't know what disaster may happen, you don't know which ship might sink, you mitigate the risk that you face. And so I think what's happening in verses one and two is, is we're being told, hey, we ought to be willing to take risk in order to receive a greater return. And as often as we're able, we ought to seek to diversify our investments in order to mitigate those risks. And then in verses three and four, we're told what we ought not to do. Now they're saying what we need to make sure we don't do is sit around just never taking any risks because we're waiting for the perfect opportunity that is risk-free. Notice in verse three, he says, if the clouds are full of rain and they they then empty themselves on the earth. If a tree falls to the south or to the north in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He's saying you're not in control of the weather. You're not in control of when it rains and you're not in control of the direction of the wind. So, verse four, he who observes the wind will not sow and he who regards the clouds will not reap. In other words, if you, if you sit around waiting for the perfect weather in order to plant your crop, uh, you may never get your seed in the ground. And then once your crop grows, if you wait for the perfect weather to harvest it, you may never get your crop in the barn. And so you can't just sit around waiting for the perfect opportunity because it may never come. And so, verse five and six, instead, what we're supposed to do, verse five is saying, because we don't know so much about the world that we live in. I mean, we don't know the way God gives life to little ones in the womb. Now, we may know more about how that works today than they did back then, but there's still a lot we don't know. I mean, we don't know the weather. We don't know how God gives life in the womb. I mean, we don't even know why it is when I see you yawn, it makes me want to yawn. I mean, this isn't crazy. We put a man on the moon and we don't, still don't know the answer to that. 
And there's so much we don't know about in this world. And he's saying, because we don't know so much about this world, verse six, what ought we to do? Instead of waiting around for the perfect opportunity, in the morning sow your seed. And at evening, you ought to still be planning. For you do not know which will prosper this or that, or whether both alike will be good. He's saying you, you ought to work hard and give yourself the most opportunities for success because you don't know which of your efforts God may choose to bless. And so, you know, we look at a text like this, not many of us are farmers, not many of us are gonna put our goods on some cargo ship that sails across the sea. And so we say, well, what does this mean for us? And I think what the text means are these essentially four principles. We ought to embrace risk. The world is filled with risk. We might as well embrace it because we can't avoid it. And then we ought to try to mitigate that risk by diversifying our investments. Invest broadly. Third, we, we shouldn't just sit and wait around for the perfect opportunity because it'll never come. Instead, we ought to work hard giving ourselves the most opportunities for success because we don't know which of our efforts God may choose to bless. Those are the four principles. Now, how do you apply those? Well, uh, let's say you're trying to make decisions about your career. Now, I think a pretty common situation you may find yourself in is, you know, you've got a good job, pays the bills, and there's this other opportunity that comes along to take a different job that has a lot of promise, but there's some risk to it. You know, what, what if you leave this job that you know is a good job and you get there and the job isn't everything they promised you it would be? What if you get there and, man, your coworkers and you, you just can't get along? What if, what if you get there and that company goes belly up because there's some weaknesses you're just not aware of? Or what if there's not a problem with that company? What if there's a problem that happens in our country? You know, what if the economy takes a downturn and there have to be layoffs? You know, your, your current job, you've got seniority there. You'd probably be one of the last to be laid off. If you take this new job, you'd be the first on the chopping block. All kinds of risks. And so how do these verses inform a decision like that? Well, the first thing they tell you is you ought to be willing to embrace risk. You ought to embrace it if it provides an opportunity for a greater return. You ought to at least be open to it. But you know what? Um, as you account for that risk, you ought to be reminded, yes, bad things could happen at that new company, but you know what? Bad things could also happen at your current one. Who knows what disaster may happen on the earth? It would also cause you to think about your exposure. You know, if, if your job is your sole source of income, you're exposed to more risk. Verse two, uh, you know, you, you may not have seven or eight sources of income, but if your spouse works full time or you have other passive sources of income, you're less exposed if the new job takes a turn for the worse. So these are the kinds of things that ought to inform your thinking as you're trying to make the decision. But, but maybe you're not in a job looking for a better one. Maybe you're currently out of work and you're looking to find a job. How do these verses inform that decision-making process? Well, one of the things they tell you is that if you're sitting there waiting for the perfect job to come along, you may never collect a paycheck again. You know, if, if you look at this and you're like, ah, oh, that's not right, and that's not right, and you, you got so many criteria for your job to, to fit and fill in your life, you got to get over it. You, you got to just get to work. A job is better than no job, Amen. <laughs> And you can keep looking for a better job while you take the first one that comes your way. And it's better to look for a job while you're collecting a paycheck than to keep looking for a job without one. Not only that, these verses would remind you that, you know, when you 
<laughs> when you get an interview scheduled, you don't pause the process. You don't say, oh, I'm not going to send any more resumes out because I got this interview and I think it's going to work out. No, you, verse 4 If you observe the wind, you're not going to sow. If you regard the clouds, you will not reap. Instead, verse 6, in the morning you ought to send out your resume, and in the evening you ought to still be sending out your resume. Because you don't know which resume is going to fall into someone's hands where the Lord is going to give you favor in the eyes of those hiring. And so I know it is difficult to send out resume after resume after resume and receive no response. But these, this text would remind you, man, get up in the morning early and start sending resumes out. And in the evening, keep sending them out. Give yourself the most opportunities for success because you don't know which of your efforts God may choose to bless. But you may not be wondering about decisions you're making with your career. You may be wondering about decisions you're making with your kids. Like uh, when to have the talk. You know, that's, a weighty topic. And there's, there's risk involved in that, right? Like you think to yourself, you know, I, I don't want to have the talk too early and risk, you know, taking away their innocence. But I don't want to wait too long because there are consequences on the other side too. How would these verses inform a decision like that? Well, first thing they tell us, we, we shouldn't sit around and wait for the perfect opportunity. You know, if you're waiting for this perfect opportunity to arise, to have the talk with your kids, you're just never going to have the conversation at all. And then you also might look at verse two and you might say, you know what? One of the ways I can mitigate my risk is by diversifying my investment. Maybe instead of trying to have the talk, which is so weighty and it's just this one conversation, maybe I split that talk into seven or eight smaller bite-sized conversations with age-appropriate information. And I hope that by repeating this conversation over time, God will cause it to sink into their head and into their heart. But most importantly, I, I think these verses not only give us information as we make decisions about our career and about our kids, most importantly this morning, what I believe the Spirit of God wants us to see is that these verses inform decisions we make about evangelism. Here at Hayes Hills, we encourage one another to tell it to two. That each member of this congregation should be praying regularly for the salvation of two non-believers and opportunities to speak the good news of the gospel to them. And you know, how, how does evangelism make you feel? Does it make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? I think almost every one of us in this room would say, absolutely it does. You know, evangelism, it, it makes me uncomfortable because there's so many risks. Like if I start to tell someone about Jesus and they ask a question and I don't know the answer, you know, what happens if I open my mouth and I start to tell someone about Jesus and I say the wrong thing? What happens if I've got this relationship with someone that I love and I speak about Jesus and it ruins the relationship? They want nothing more to do with me. There are risks involved, aren't there? And so what does this text tell us about how we ought to act when it comes to evangelism? The first thing it tells us is that we ought to be willing to embrace risk. You know, we, we don't, we don't want to lose any relationships, do we? But we all have relationships with people we know and we love and we know they are lost and we know they need Jesus. And the reason we know they need Jesus is because we know we need Jesus. Like we know we are all sinners. We have disobeyed God. We deserve death and hell. But thankfully, in love, Jesus stepped into the world. He lived a perfect life. He went to the cross. He died in our place to pay the penalty for our sin. Then on the third day, he rose from the dead, defeating sin, death, and the devil. And he now lives to offer forgiveness of sin, eternal life. The indwelling Holy Spirit to all of those who turn from sin and put their trust in Jesus and follow him. 
And because we have experienced God's grace in our life, what we want most for those around us is for them to experience God's grace in their life too. And so we all have people that we love, that we know are lost, and we know they need Jesus. And so often what happens is we think, man, if, if I say something, this relationship, it may be ruined. And so what tends to happen is we just, we sit there and we think, okay, Lord, I'm just gonna continue to pray for their salvation. And one day they're just gonna walk up to me and say, hey, would you tell me about Jesus out of the blue? But you know, if you wait for the perfect opportunity, it may never happen. I mean, is that the strategy we see on the pages of the New Testament? I mean, do we find the Apostle Paul sipping a latte in some coffee shop in Corinth and he's just waiting for somebody to come to his table and say, hey, can you tell me about Jesus? Do we find Jesus doing good works, being kind to people, being really silent and saying, man, I just hope, Father, that someone will come and ask me a question about you so then I can start to speak. Or do on the pages of the New Testament, do we see the church moving boldly to speak to the world about the good news of salvation in Jesus? If you wait for the perfect opportunity, it may never come. And look, we don't want to lose any relationship. But we must be willing to lose any relationship if we're gonna follow Jesus faithfully. I mean, isn't that what Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, where he said, if anyone comes after me and they do not hate their father and their mother and their wife and their children, yes, if they do not hate even their own life, they cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying, if, if you don't even hate in comparison to your love for me, if you, if you don't hate the relationships that matter most to you and are closest to you, if you can't risk that relationship for the sake of the gospel of Jesus, you cannot faithfully follow me. And so, yes, there is risk involved in speaking up. But if you remain silent, one day you're gonna kick yourself at their funeral. You see, it is risky to speak up, but it is far riskier not to. And what the text is saying is that we must open our mouth, we must take a risk for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ and speak to those around us. Because what, what we sow, Jesus made clear in Mark chapter four, is the word of God. And as we sow it around the world, we need to sow broadly. We need to give a portion, verse two to seven, a portion to eight, because as we sow the word, we sow it in various soils in human hearts. You may go and you may speak of Jesus to someone and their heart is so hard, they want nothing to do with any of it. You may go and speak to someone about Jesus and they might embrace him enthusiastically and you're so excited, man, they got it. Praise the Lord, they're saved. But then you find out that God's word hasn't really taken root in their heart. And so the first time they encounter difficulty, they learn Jesus isn't a cheat code for life that makes everything easy and nice and good. When they have some suffering, they just turn right around and head back to their old life. But you know what else is gonna happen? Sometimes when you open your mouth and you tell someone about Jesus, you're gonna see the Holy Spirit of God give them a heart that is receptive to his word. And they're gonna receive it with joy. It will take root in their life and it will transform them from the inside out. There is nothing better than that. And so what the text is calling us to do is to say, look, don't sit around waiting for the perfect opportunity. We, we ought to be sowing God's word in the morning. We ought to still be speaking of him in the evening. We, we ought to work hard and give ourselves as many opportunities for success as possible because you don't know, you don't know which of your efforts God may bless. I've got people in my life that I've known for 20 plus years and I don't know how many times I've had a gospel conversation with them. 
And frankly, sometimes I think they just kind of, you know, nod their head and they're like, here he goes again. But I keep speaking to them because one of the things I ask for most in my life is that I would get to be there on the day when they are baptized. And I don't know which time I may open my mouth and the Holy Spirit of God may make them receptive to hear his word and put their trust in him. And so church, may we be willing to embrace risk. And if we're going to take risks anywhere in life, let's be sure we're taking risks for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As much as possible in our lives, let us try to mitigate those risks by diversifying our investments. And if we're going to invest in anything broadly, let it be in the lives of the lost and the work of the kingdom of God. May we give our time, our energy, our money, may we use the words of our mouth to invest them in the lives of the eternal good of those around us. May we not sit around waiting for the perfect opportunity to come our way because it may never come. So may we work hard giving ourselves the most opportunities for success because we do not know which of our efforts God may choose to bless. Church, may we not grow weary in doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And so will you take a risk for Jesus this week? You know, who is it in your life that you know is lost and you know they need Jesus? And yet you have been waiting for the right moment to have that conversation. Stop waiting for that moment. Would you take a risk out of love of Jesus and love of them this week? And would you say, this week it's gonna happen. And you just... Pray to the Lord and say, Lord, this is scary. I know it's risky. Lord, I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna lose this relationship. I don't wanna push them away. So Lord, would you not only go with me, would you go before me and prepare their heart to hear your word? And then when you finish that prayer, you go to start that conversation. And I'm praying next Sunday when I show up, I'm just hearing the plinking of ping pong balls because there are so many orange balls going in that foyer display because we've all had a gospel conversation this week. Because we haven't been called to sit and wait for the right opportunity. We are sent as heralds of the good news that the world desperately needs to hear. So will you take a risk for Jesus this week? Who is it that you've been waiting to have the conversation with? Don't wait any longer. This week, sow the word. Cast your bread upon the waters and you'll find it again after many days.